We talk a lot about cutting carbon, less about where to put it once it's out of the air. How can we uh, address collective action in a way that is biologically sound? Could we merge those two theoretical uh, frameworks into some kind of empirical test? Turns out nature already knows. Forests, estuaries, grasslands, they're doing the heavy lifting of carbon capture every day, quietly, efficiently. Essentially, we think about conservation of ecosystems, sustainable management of ecosystems, and the third pillar is the restoration of ecosystems. So the question becomes, how do we align climate solutions with the lived reality of the land? It's a convergence of different disciplines and, and, and different peoples working on a shared mission. That's exactly what CARBS is trying to figure out. CARBS is short for the Convergence to Accelerate Research on Biological Sequestration. We have a combination uh, of data science with artificial intelligence, genomics, uh, as well as ecosystem science, biology, social sciences as well. We, we try to develop a shared understanding of, of the limitations and opportunities in the, in the world of carbon sequestration. We're going to try and take things we see from space, we see across the entire world from satellites, all the way down to the sort of DNA of the plants and microbes in the ground, uh, and try and sort of stitch them together through these kind of AI pipelines. Well, carbon is, is essentially interested in how carbon moves from the atmosphere into the soil and, and back, and microbes are crucially involved, centrally involved in and transforming carbon into forms that can move from soil to the atmosphere, from the atmosphere to the soil. By restoration, we mean uh, restoration in the sense that uh, we can bring the system back to, to some kind of uh, functionality uh, that is sustainable, both from an ecological perspective, as well as from a social perspective. What it really means is this, bringing together cutting edge science, lived experience, cultural knowledge, to get a better handle on how carbon moves through ecosystems and how we can support it. You know, there's this uh, usual assumption that we understand everything there is to know about carbon cycling, and, but that's not true. There's a lot we don't understand. This isn't lab coats standing around a whiteboard. It's collaboration between scientists, land stewards, tribal partners. With boots on the ground in forests, estuaries, farmlands, and floodplains across the Pacific Northwest. We are installing an eddy covariance tower in salt marsh in uh, South Slough Estuary, which is uh, an arm of the Coos Bay Estuary. This is one of the flux towers. Basically, a giant breathalyzer for the landscape. Every few seconds, it measures the carbon dioxide moving in and out of the ecosystem, tracking what the plants take in during photosynthesis and what they release through respiration. And we can think about that as metabolism of the land or the land breathing. So we're able to actually see this exchange of carbon between the land and the atmosphere over a habitat such as a salt marsh. In wetlands, it's actually also really important to think about what's happening in the soil below the plants, so sort of the below ground compartment. And to do that, we have to actually uh, dig into the sediments. We take cores, we uh, take samples uh, from the surface down to up to a meter or even deeper to look at how much carbon is held in those sediments, how quickly it accumulated there, and what kinds of carbon it is. We take these samples and along the soil column we're able to see certain time points. Along those time points we can correlate to different elemental or uh, community composition points. Carbon isn't just carbon. It comes in different forms like subtle signatures. With isotope tracing, researchers can track those signatures as they move through the soil, water, and plants. Like putting a GPS tag on a molecule. It tells us where the carbon came from, how fast it's moving, and what part of the ecosystem is holding on to it, or letting it go. It's one of the only ways we can actually see the invisible journey of carbon through the ecosystem. So all organisms, all of life, have genetic material uh, in their cells, you know, inside them, it's made up of DNA. And when a, a plant grows in a particular place, it leaves a, a little bit of its DNA behind. And we can use that DNA to understand what organisms have been present in the recent past and what organisms are present there now. So it's, it's sort of like forensic science. We use it to reconstruct ecosystem change. 
In this particular project, we're looking at gradients from forests to estuaries, you know, across the region, the Pacific Northwest region, which holds vast amounts of carbon, vast amounts of biodiversity and water, as well as long traditions of human ingenuity adapting to, to many forms of environmental change, including changing landscapes. An artificial intelligence, analyzing vast swathes of satellite and sensor data to spot patterns humans can't. What AI allows us to do is, I think, embrace the level of complexity of our data we couldn't do previously. You might look at one, two variables. You might use this to predict or process model fluxes at different levels. With these AI tools, we can take you know, hundreds of variables and essentially let the, what we measure from the world tell us how those relate to various carbon processes. So it's a very sort of data-driven method. It generally gives you very high predictive quality. So we can use those sort of approaches to, to help us scale up. So to look for patterns that emerge when we combine lots of different bits of information across a landscape. And indigenous knowledge, offering thousands of years of insight into how landscapes behave and how they recover. The estuarine systems around here are extraordinarily filled in and choked mostly because people wanted to raise cattle instead of uh, take advantage of the estuary. So they filled in the landscape, which mean they narrowed the alluvial span of the river. And so we would like to know what did the river look like in the 1850s before Americans arrived? And how can we possibly improve the environment, especially with the results from carbs? For the Coquille Indian tribe, this isn't just about carbon. It's about self-determination. The river, the forests, the floodplains. They're ancient homelands. And by co-designing restoration strategies with university scientists, it's reclaiming not just land, but leadership in the climate conversation. We see it as a necessary step in the co-production of knowledge, in the generation of hypotheses and, and solutions that are meaningful, not only technically so, but also from the perspective uh, uh, of cultural um, sustainability. Together, this creates a kind of ecological intelligence, one that sees carbon not just as a commodity, but as part of a living adaptive system. Here's the goal create restoration strategies that don't just look good on paper, but work in the real world. In carbs, we've taken that health metaphor, you know, that ecosystems can be healthy or unhealthy. We've taken that kind of the next step, and we've used this metaphor where we suggest that what we would like to develop is something you know, similar to personalized medicine. In the sense that we pay attention to the historical uh, baselines of every system locally, then at the landscape scale, then at the regional scale. So we'd like to do something similar for environments. This means flexible models, adaptive tie lines, and land management plans that feel less like mandates, more like options communities can choose from. CARBS is showing that science doesn't have to be top down. It can be co-produced, co-owned, and co-implemented and in that way create a really place-based approach to managing ecosystems. In hopes that we can understand that context and do targeted interventions, which could be conservation, management, or restoration of ecosystems, in a way that will be tailored to the best possible outcomes, both on the ecological side of things as well as on the social side. This is not a one-person job or a one-tribe job. It's going to take a global effort to change the carbon imprint that we are having on this globe. By weaving that approach into everything from carbon accounting to conservation planning is laying the foundation for something bigger. Climate solutions that are just as resilient as the ecosystems they aim to restore.